This video is on suspension, and to leave you in suspense, let me first tell you about NordVPN. If you're looking for a VPN to give you additional privacy protection when traversing the internet and the unique ability to virtually position yourself geographically around the world, then you might want to look at NordVPN. They have over 5,500 servers across 60 countries, so you can do all manner of things. Watch US Netflix when not in the US. Watch Sky Sports F1 when not in the UK, as I did when travelling for work. Watch. Well, who knows what you're watching? That's your business. And it'll stay your business with NordVPN with its double data decryption, no data logging, and cyber sec security. It'll even work from China. NordVPN are offering Chain Bear View as a two year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount when you visit nordvpn.com slash chainbear and use code chainbear at checkout. So go to nordvpn.com slash chainbear. Now, back to the video. This is part two of our couple of videos looking at suspension. I'd recommend watching the first video first, obviously, but let's quickly look at where we are so far and how the suspension is set up on an F1 car. We're looking at the front end of the car where the wheels are structurally mounted to the chassis via wishbones and a push rod connects the wheel mounts to a rocker inside the front nose. As the wheel rises relative to the chassis, the push rod pushes on the rocker, rotating it around an axis. The rocker is connected along this axis to a metal torsion bar fixed to the chassis at the other end so as to force a twisting motion along the bar which the torsion bar resists and recoils from like a spring. When released, the torsion bar springs back to its original shape. When people talk about the front springs of an F1 car, they're actually referring to its torsion bars. Now to stop the torsion bar springing back uncontrollably and causing the car to bounce around, fluid filled pistons are connected to the system via the rocker to absorb the energies going into and out of the torsion bar. These are called dampers or shock absorbers, though they're not the only dampening system of the car. Together all of this smooths out the violence of the vertical motion experienced by the wheels so the chassis can remain relatively stable. Now bumps and curbs aren't the only thing suspension needs to handle, far from it. Because all of the driver inputs into the car are very powerful, the car needs to be able to control the energies across the chassis and into the wheels. When a car brakes, the centre of mass shifts forward, putting more weight over the front wheels. This will naturally cause the front suspension to compress and the rear suspension to relax, pitching the car forward. The opposite is true under hard acceleration. The weight shifts backwards, compressing the rear suspension and pitching the car back. When a car turns a corner, the centre of mass shifts to the outside of the car, putting more weight on the outside wheels. In this case, the car's outer suspension compresses while the inside relaxes as it goes light. The car moving away from its desired platform, which is sort of flat but not quite because engineers build in some rake for aerodynamic reasons, presents a number of issues. The first is simply that, due to the cars being so low to the ground, you can easily have the floor or the wings or whatever hit the ground and damage the car. This can be managed to an extent by packers, which are basically like bumpers inside the suspension which limit how far they can travel. Another issue is the aerodynamics will behave less than optimally if you're rocking the car in all manner of angles away from its design position. You want to present the car to the airflow at the desired angle. Things like rake and wing angles are there for a reason. Thirdly, when cornering, your tyres will roll off their desired camber. I've done a whole video on camber which is technically part of the suspension setup, but in simple terms it's how the tyres are angled relative to the horizontal. Now you're probably going to camber in your tyres a little because cornering will induce a roll in the car, and as mentioned the weight moves to the outside and loads up the outside tyre. As such, you want the outside load bearing tyre to present as squarely to the track as possible to maximise how much tread meets the tarmac to prevent wear, degradation and temperature issues. Part of controlling the roll of the car will come through the suspension. But let's start with heave. Heave is essentially when both front or rear suspensions are compressed or expanded at the same time. Like under braking when the car pitches forward, the nose is forced down and the wheels, relative to the car, move up. This forms a dual compression from both sides of the front suspension. Now, we may not want the front of the car dropping so dramatically. We don't want the front wing hitting the ground, we don't want the rake unsettled, we don't want the rear wheels going too light, etc, etc. So we can put in a heave damper and or heave spring connecting the two rockers to resist and control their rotation if both sides try and compress simultaneously. Now the front drops, the push rods on both sides push their rockers inwards, 
the heave spring resists and absorbs their force, preventing the front dipping too dramatically and keeps the car stable. Note that the heave spring only comes into play when left and right both compress against one another. If the car rolls, it will move freely with the dampers. Conversely, the outer dampers affect each wheel independently. So now let's consider roll. As a car turns, the centre of mass shifts to the outside, causing the car to roll outwards. This puts the car in an unfavourable aerodynamic position, affects mechanical grip, and may roll the tyres off their desired footprint. Part of countering this is the anti-roll bar. In a normal car, the anti-roll bar is a wide, U-shaped bar attached at either end to the suspension mount and fixed in the middle to the chassis. Without a roll bar, the outside, load-bearing tyre rises relative to the chassis, so you end up in this situation with the outside tyre very high and the inside tyre very low. With an anti-roll bar, as the outside tyre rises under compression, it pulls up its end of the U-shape. As the U-bar is allowed to rotate, this forces the other end of the bar up. This therefore lifts the other wheel relative to the chassis, so the discrepancy is reduced as the car levels out. The outside wheel lifts, forcing the inside wheel to lift too, so instead of rolling, the car stays much more level. Now, like the torsion bar, this length of metal does have some give in it, so it is allowed to twist. You can adjust the stiffness of your anti-roll bar to dictate just how much it resists rolling forces in the car. Now, in an F1 car, this fairly large unit has been reimagined into a small U formed of a small torsion bar joining two arms connected to the rockers. I mean, I say this, but actually F1 teams have been coming up with various novel versions of the anti-roll bar, but this is the main principle of the design. There's some great Craig Scarborough diagrams of some other solutions that I'll link to down in the description. Note that the anti-roll bar will lower the car overall as it balances both sides into alignment by compressing both. So that's something you need to consider in setup. Controlling roll overall is a collaboration between the anti-roll bar and the outer suspension and dampers. Both play their part and setup adjustments between the two should find the right balance in finding the desired roll characteristic of the car. We've been mainly looking at the front suspension, but the rear suspension is fundamentally similar except the rocker assembly is mounted vertically, allowing for components to be better arranged around the gearbox, powertrain and crash structure. Naturally, it doesn't require the steering arm either. Setting up your suspension for ideal speed and handling is a matter of feel for the demands of the circuit and its relationship with your car design. In general, softer, more compliant suspension will more ably absorb jolts and bumps and ride the curbs more smoothly but it will lead to more roll and pitch and handle more sluggishly. Stiffer suspension is more bumpy but has less roll and keeps the car stable. This can result in less mechanical grip, but greater handling sensitivity and responsiveness. So maybe precise driving between barriers may benefit from some stiffness if it can handle the natural bumps of a street track surface. A fast, aero-heavy track may prefer the stability of a stiff setup, whereas a twisty track with slow to medium corners will benefit from a softer setup to squeeze more mechanical turning grip out of the car. And of course, this isn't just a matter of sliding the car setup between soft and stiff, but combining the spring stiffness of the torsion bar with the compression and expansion characteristics of the dampers and the heave spring with the give of the anti-roll bar and everything works together and affects the other. Now there are many innovative and clever inventions within the suspension systems of F1 cars and these videos have just outlined the basic common structures. Over and again teams have sought to subvert the norms to rearrange the layout, bend the regulations and eke out a more controlled performance from the suspension. Hopefully though these videos will give you a solid base from which to understand further talk of suspension throughout F1 weekends. <laughs>